you are about to get a masterclass on how to transplant outdoors from a soil scientist. Now, what we're gonna look at is, for example, planting depths of tomatoes and peppers, how to plant things like cucumbers or vining plants, because they have a little bit of special, they have special conditions they need. We're gonna look at how to transplant flowers. We are going to look at exactly where granular fertilizer should be placed relative to the plant root, what the soil around the plant root should look like prior to planting it into the ground. If you're not here for a long haul, this video is probably not for you. This is for Geek Crew members who want to get a little bit more science into transplanting and or absolute beginners that need to figure out the basics when it comes to this and want a very granular breakdown. Number one is the difference between adventitious roots and differential stem cell tissue. These are two totally different concepts. One, we know very well. The other, I think, is kind of like this hidden talent that plants have that people are mixing up as adventitious roots, but that's not the case. Here's the thing. Some plants can grow roots from their stems. Example, tomatoes. Those little warty bumps, not the hairs. The warty bumps. The hairs are trichomes that make the smell of the plant and all the oils, the glandular oils. But the little tiny warts, those warty things are the beginnings of an adventitious root. When it comes to peppers, when it comes to plants, when it comes to anything that you have in the past, put lower down into the soil profile, you are dealing with undifferentiated stem cell tissue and therefore should treat it differently or you will end up with rot. And I've seen it time and time again because many a times people think, well, I just bury my peppers the same depth I bury my tomatoes and that's not the case. Essentially, plants have something called meristematic tissue and this meristematic tissue is tissue that's undifferentiated stem cells and when exposed to certain conditions, it will develop certain limbs, if you will. So if the environmental signaling is like, hey, Mr. Pepper, your bottom end is in some deep, dark hole, I'm just not going to elaborate. I could have made a very bad joke about, but I'm not going to. Anyways, but that environment, regardless of how you think about it, is an environment that the plant then signals to its lower half hey, listen, we gotta make roots because things are not good. We're not, if we put leaves out in this space, kapuskis, we're done. And this is done through various different hormones. There's auxins, there's cytokinins, and they regulate this entire process. What that means though, is it doesn't come as naturally to peppers in this example as it does to tomatoes. So if you're going to go this route, you need to keep in mind that that plant is under some pressure to develop roots. And if you're not getting any above ground growth or things seem to look like they've stalled out. It's not necessarily that the plant is dead or dying or, you know, frozen in time and space. It's probably working on something behind the scenes that you are not able to see. Now, if you don't want to deal with a plant slowing down, no green greenery, just plant the peppers flush with the soil. There's no actual purpose to planting peppers lower in a soil system, unless of course it is in a very warm environment, such as a container or a raised bed that is in direct sun, 12 hours a day. That case, you may wanna bury it just to protect those roots against the heat. But again, peppers like warm soil. So I, to me personally, where I am, there's no environmental factor that makes it too intense. And so therefore I, will always just flush with the soil surface. And I've been starting to do that for years now. That brings me into the next one, and that is the planting depth. So tomatoes famously are sunk up to like the fifth leaf now at this point, I think I've seen. And the reason for that is because the deeper you go in the soil system, the cooler the soil becomes. Now here's the thing to think about. I've done a whole video on this if you wanna go check it out. And it's about the five mistakes when it comes to tomatoes. But needless to say, cooler being better is in the eye of the beholder. The reason why we care about soil temp and making it cooler in some cases is because it controls a number of different factors. On this channel, I kind of pride myself on not just making content for Canadians. I do pride myself on hopefully, I believe to be, giving you tools to be able to determine wherever you may be on planet Earth exactly how to go about planting and utilizing the soil and the plants and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna give you the tools to be able to navigate the depth in which you should plant your tomatoes. You need to put the work in to make the decision for yourself where to go. I highly advocate for being your own garden scientist. Personally, I would try 
a number of different depths to start for the first year and then kind of monitor what happens and then go from there. That would probably be ideal. But regardless, what we're looking for is the soil temp. So when you dig down into that soil profile and you have your soil test thermometer, temp thermometer, and you're kind of temping the soil as you go down, you're gonna notice that the temperature drops lower and lower and lower. The temperature we want is a minimum, minimum, of 10 degrees Celsius or more, but less than 30. You get a really accurate bottom of the barrel, how low it can get would be at night. After things have cooled down a little bit, you wanna go in and then do the test because raised beds can drop anywhere from five to 10 degrees Celsius in some cases, depending on the medium that's in there, whether you're using soil or peat or compost, whatever the case may be. And that's gonna give you a really good indicator of how low it can become. And then obviously you can test during the day to see how hot it becomes and then test throughout the season if needed or if you're just curious. What you're gonna find is that in-ground beds are going to be colder the deeper you get. Raised beds are going to be warmer the deeper you get compared to the raised the in-grounds and containers are going to be even warmer than both of those. <laughs> Furthermore, you can have microclimates just in your own space. My backyard, shady, cooler. For example, my perennials are hardly up right now. Front yard, perennials are up, things are flowering. It's way warmer up there. You need to navigate those three different potential soil systems combined with, in this case, two different potential microclimates to determine where things should sit. I gave you the range you wanna hit, hit that range. From what I have read, the whole tomato sinking thing, the absolute max you wanna sink these two is to the first true leaves, not four, five, six. That's not helpful at all. What is helpful is like up to the first true leaf. Just keep that in mind. If you've already sunk them when you bump them up, don't sink them again because you're just causing a lot of stress and it hasn't shown to actually increase any yield whatsoever. So the reason why colder is not better is because it will literally slow everything down. It'll put everything into a dormancy very easily. Next up is hardening off. I like to use the bucket trick. The bucket trick is super easy to do. All you need to do is literally cut the bottom of the bucket off pop it over top of the plant when you go to transplant. You want that bucket to be taller than the plant, not by a lot, just by a little bit. So this can range. I've used base cell containers for things that are smaller like cucumbers. I've used yogurt containers with cucumbers as well. Those are smaller. Tomatoes, I've used buckets like five gallons. What this will do is it will slowly harden the plant off. It'll shade it, it'll buffer it from wind, and I usually leave it on for about two weeks and then I will slip it off. And in some cases I just leave it behind. I leave it on the plant. It doesn't really matter. I personally find it's a little bit easier to get really good root waterings in rather than having them kind of go everywhere. It's also much easier to water and not get it all over the leaves when you just kind of put the hose into the bucket and then you allow everything to drain through. Now, when it comes to cucumbers, melons, or winter squash, anything that vines, these plants are incredibly sensitive to transplant. So ideally you would have started them in a paper or a peat or a choir pot, something that decomposes. And then all you wanna do is cause the least amount of root disruption possible. You want to put them into a container of water, soak it within an inch of its life, make it so that the pot is basically falling apart. And then you want to pot that pot and the plant into the soil. You can sink it a little bit. I wouldn't sink it too much, but the key here is not to to disrupt those roots in any capacity because that will cause stress. And these guys are very sensitive to hardening off. I would definitely consider that bucket trick even if you have hardened them off the old school way prior to that. And you wanna leave it on. Leave the bucket on in this case until you see new growth. Once you see new growth, you can pop it off, you're good to go. Well, let's talk about soil prep of the hole before you go in and start putting plants at different depths and test and temps and whatever else. Number one is that we want there to be no shovel marks, spade marks, where we can see shine. If it looks shiny and kind of glazed, you're pretty much making like a bowl in the ground, which will capture water and that will work to your detriment in a lot of cases. So if that has happened, what you wanna do is you want to rough up the edges and incorporate a compost, a peat moss, something of that nature, about 50% of the space with that and make the hole bigger. The hole, make your hole bigger than three times the size of the pot. That's totally normal. That's exactly what you need to do. The more, the better. From there, you have two options before you plant the plants because option one has to happen right now. And that is where you place the fertilizer. You have top dressing and you have in-ground root set fertilizer. What's the difference between the two? Nutrients placed near the roots is much faster when it comes to uptake 
it is much easier for microbes and mechanical degradation to happen in the form of moisture and leaching and kind of all that fun stuff. But it also runs the risk of burning your roots. And that goes for both organic and synthetics. Top dressing, you don't have that root burn zone potential, but you do have the potential to lose a bulk of that nutrients from something called volatilization, which is the gassing off of the fertilizer. And I know we look at it and we're like, we don't see any gases. This, what do you mean? All fertilizer is gas. It's just the way it happens. Therefore, when you have it exposed to the soil surface, this is something that will take place that you cannot control. So here's the thing, this is what I do. You can choose to do it or not. I put in that root ball zone, typically is a compost manure or a peat combined with a granular slow release fertilizer. And I don't do an organic form of this. I do do a synthetic form of this. You can do what you want. It doesn't really matter. It is my preference. You're allowed to have your own preference. I'm not dogmatic when it comes to gardening, I say, do what you want. Your little garden isn't doing much to the environment, I can assure you of that. You're reducing your carbon footprint by making your groceries in your yard. And if you're successful at that, then you are benefiting the world because hashtag semis and trains. And that granular fertilizer I place is going to be placed two inches below where I intend to put that root ball. This leaves it out of the immediate space where the transplants are sitting, but within reach and in reach in a good way because it's below the root ball where the roots will actually try to dig down to get those nutrients and ultimately will cause a more robust root ball and a plant that's better at capturing both nutrients and water later on in the season. From there, what I will do is I will do a top dressing of compost or manure. One year I will do manure, many times I will do different compost, so vegetable, mushroom, chicken, cow, like it, I will do varying versions of both. And what I'm looking for is literally quite, it's like less than half an inch just on that soil surface. And the purpose for that isn't so much fertilizer as it is to help with moisture retention, soil structure, some nutrients, don't get me wrong, some nutrients. And ultimately my insurance plan for that soil to be healthy and fit going on into the future. Now what yours may look like is just simply granular fertilizer sprinkled on the soil surface. That works. Maybe it looks like you put a little bit of compost or manure down in the hole. If you wanna go that route and you wanna put organics kind of in and around the plant root, you may wanna do the same thing. Or what I would do if I was you is I would dig a hole that's even bigger than the root ball by a lot. And then again, 50% of that being a manure or a compost, something to that effect in and around that root ball below sides, all of it, preferably a bulk of it below so that the roots will drive down and then just regular soil on top of that. Once everything is planted, I do like to protect the roots because I don't sink my plants to the hilt for reasons discussed earlier. I will utilize things like hemp mats or the potato donuts as a way to suppress weeds and competition around that tomato base and also to prevent root disruption when I go to water because I don't have a really sophisticated watering system. It's called me, myself, and I. And that can come in the form of buckets or hand watering with like a hose, but that can actually be a decent amount of pressure and enough pressure to cause problems. And therefore, because of that, I will put these kind of blockades on the bottom or I will put some mulch on the bottom. I will do the donut, not the volcano method. And that can be enough at times as well. I just find that the hemp mats particular are really good at it. I started using them last year and I was like, whoa, this is why these exist. Once all that's completed, you're pretty much off to the races. From there, you just want to water the plant on a regular basis. A fail safe, to be totally honest, for in-ground and raised beds in particular, is to water every single day. And that will just ensure that everything will be hunky-dory come the end of the season. You wanna do this for about two weeks. You can't really overwater in a system that's connected to the earth around it. In a container setting, you can overwater pretty easily. And, but I'm gonna do a whole video that's gonna come out later this week about how to make sure you've watered enough and how to water properly hydrophobic soil, you name it. Like literally the whole kit and caboodle when it comes to water. Here's the last thing that I want you to think about. The difference between organic soil, meaning a medium that was living at one point, compost, manure, peat, choir, anything like that, leaf mold, literally endless list, and mineral soil. So the soil beneath our, our feet, the topsoil, if you will. The difference between those two in regards to transplanting and in particular temps and water holding capacities. So raised beds or containers, 
that include a majority organic material have more abrupt and extreme temperature swings. And we know this because we've looked at the thermal behaviors between organic soils and top soils because it happens naturally in nature. There are soils out there, peat soils from peat bogs, that are completely organic. It's an entire order actually of soil is organic. And so therefore we have tried to understand it. These fluctuations can be quite extreme, up to 10 degrees Celsius between daytime and nighttime. And so therefore, if you have a plant that's special to you or one that you really wanna succeed in, it may be important to consider that and mitigate it with either more mineral soil, putting it in the ground, putting it in a raised bed. Maybe you have to put it in a container because that's what you're limited to and you want the ability to get that plant warmed up quickly or cooled down quickly. Mineral soil is what we consider more stable temperature wise. However, that can also mean cooler by a lot and it stays cooler by a lot. And therefore, for example, peppers, I never plant in ground because if I plant them in ground, they do poorly. I get weak yields, not great results. Containers, however, in a potting soil that I can warm up nice and quick, I can move around if I need to, has high moisture holding capacity, all those things. Also drains really easy, good aeration, you name it. I use organic soil only. I will only use potting soil for my peppers. They do not and never have set foot in a single garden bed in this garden in literal years. If you're new to the Geek Crew and you recently hit subscribed, you're new to gardening or you're a veteran here on this channel, I'm sorry, your therapy checks are coming. There's no real wrong way to do this to be totally honest, because you can be your own garden scientist. You can do whatever you want. There is no rules. No one's there to tell you you're being bad when you do something. And if there is, that person needs to get a life. All of these things are important because your microclimates, again, just even in your own yards, is different than my microclimate. The amount of times in the field where I've seen a scenario played out and then recommended the fix to that scenario to a different farmer, that there's a huge disconnect. That, even in the same area, it won't work. It just, there's too much variability in plant and soil science to really give you a firm, this is what you should do. And therefore, again, I want you to experiment and find out what works best for you. Now, with that being said, if you are new here, the Geek Crew is an absolute fantastic crew of people that have been here for ages or are relatively new. And they do support each other in the comment section down below. It's not uncommon to find someone commenting, I am from Kentucky, blah, blah, blah zone and I grow these plants, and this is what I've done with my soil when transplanting in the past. Geek crew, veterans who always do this, the floor is yours. You are smarter than me, and again, you know those microclimates a heck of a lot better than me, and therefore your opinion is literally just as valuable, if not more valuable and practical, than mine. I will talk to you guys later. Have fun gardening.